President. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr President, the Opposition will be supporting uh, the, this bill on the second reading vote and we will be moving certain amendments uh, to the bill to uh, uh, improve it uh, and, and expand its scope, uh, not only in terms of the, the mandating of uh, the use of Australian-made steel in projects paid for by the New South Wales Government and also for, by local councils, but also to make sure that there is going to be a tough cop on the beat to make sure that uh, there is adequate compliance with Australian standards uh, and some other matters that I will come to. Uh, Mr President, the future of steelmaking jobs uh, in the Illawarra and elsewhere in the steel industry and for those who depend upon the steel industry is a matter of prime concern. It's a matter of public record that there is now a full-blown crisis in the Australian steel industry. And uh, it's unfortunate, having heard the response from the government, that they do not appear to understand the gravity of that crisis or the need for resolute action by all levels of government um, to ensure that this strategic industry is given the best chance of a secure future. Uh, not only because of the thousands of jobs that it supports directly and indirectly and the effect that has upon our economic and social fabric, but also the impact it will have for supply chains uh, across the country, not only the state of New South Wales, uh, and across industries. On Monday of this week, the New South Wales Labor opposition announced a comprehensive, secure and sustainable steels jobs package of measures, proposing substantial changes to the state's procurement policy, which will, for the first time, explicitly consider a whole-of-life assessment of steel use in major infrastructure projects. Uh, that was announced on Monday in the Illawarra by myself and Labor Shadow Treasurer and Shadow Minister for the Illawarra, uh, Mr Ryan Park MP. The package also includes a review of the state's infrastructure plan, providing an indicative future demand <coughs> for Australian-made steel and infrastructure projects, setting up a known pipeline of projects so that Australian steel producers can plan for the demand. A steel industry advocate would also be appointed to ensure new Australian standards and certification for Australian-made steel use is monitored and complied with and will be based in the Yellowwarra. And, Mr President, these will be the subject matters of, our, of Labor's amendments. Uh, this will stop different classifications and low-quality imported standards of steel being used in publicly funded state infrastructure. The, state, the steel industry advocate will also be tasked with undertaking a major New South Wales steel and fabrication sector review focusing on the supply chain capability of the sector, coordination of innovation and research and development, and investments in plant and equipment. Uh, Labor's steel and jobs policy follows extensive consultation with a range of uh, steel unions, their work for the workforces, and of course steel industry stakeholders after threats to the continued production of steel at Bluescope Steel last year. New South Wales Labor supported the state government's payroll tax concessions for Bluescope Steel last year. We didn't seek to play politics with that. We recognised that supporting the government's offering was in the public interest. It's a shame the government has not reciprocated on this uh, uh, steel plan initiative. Um, it's critical that no further measures have been implemented to support a sustainable future for the steel industry and jobs in that industry. Uh, a BIS shrapnel report published in August 2015 confirmed that if the steel industry stopped steel production in the Illawarra, it would wipe out $3 billion in the value of the region's economy and up to 10,000 jobs would be lost. But, Mr President, the, the damage would go further because there are many businesses and communities that supply goods and services to the steel industry. Many of them are located in Sydney's west and south west and in the Hunter as well. Um, it will impact, it would impact supply chains for other industries um, and the damage it would do would be potentially immeasurable to our economy. Uh, this is a case not of protectionism, but of sensible recalibration of government policy. Um, I, note, I note what the, uh, the Minister has said about uh, and it was his first desperate port of call, is that this would somehow violate free trade agreements. I will come to that because it's worth noting that Many of the countries with whom we have these free trade agreements 
are in the process of not only whacking tariffs to protect their domestic steel industries, like the United States, like the United States, I acknowledge that interjection, um, and at a state level in America, uh, but, but, but also uh, taking other measures. Uh, we do not think this would violate any of Australia's free trade obligations because we're not seeking to mandate this policy for industry generally. This goes to the choice of a customer, the New South Wales government and the taxpayers through council. Yes, I acknowledge that interjection as well, but it, it simply lays down a marker saying that we as a customer, as a purchaser, would take a certain approach. Customers are allowed to do that. Um, uh, there's nothing in the free trade agreements that mandates that customers must somehow divvy up their purchases domestically and internationally. It's about ideology. Wow, well, this, this, the government's response is about ideology. Um, now, to place this whole matter in context, Bluescope Steel is the major flat steel producer for the domestic Australian, New Zealand and US markets from New South Wales, and it's a, a leading international supplier of steel products. But over the years, the high Australian dollar, weakening product demand and oversupply of cheap international steel being dumped onto the domestic Australian market has led Bluescope to, to Bluescope facing significant financial trouble. The long-term stability and sustainability of the Bluescope Steelworks is at risk, creating substantial job uncertainty for the Illawarra, and as a consequence for those who work in businesses providing supplies to the steel industries, including, as I've indicated, southwestern Sydney and the Hunter. But of course it affects other industries in the Illawarra as well. And of course if you take all of those jobs out of the local economy, all of those pay packets out of the local supermarkets and local industries generally, you see a, a death spiral for the Illawarra community and their economy. And of course that, like throwing a, a rock into the middle of a, a body of water, the ripples will go out with it across the economy of New South Wales. Mm. In 2015, Bluescope Steel sought government assistance for payroll tax relief, and the government eventually provided assistance, which includes a $60 million, $6 million, $60 million in deferred payroll tax payments over three years from 2016 to 28. Now, while these concessions are important to improving Bluescope's uh, financial position, the ultimate solution is increasing demand for Australian steel. It's the only real solution to ensuring the company's ongoing sustainability. But more importantly than the fate of any one company or its workers <coughs> is the continuing production of steel in New South Wales. The steel industry employs over 100,000 people in Australia, uh, but of course New South Wales is the heartland of the Australian industry. Um, construction sector makes up 80% of demand, however private demand has contracted and is expected to continue to contract over the next three to four years. Domestic production now supplies less than half the steel used in public infrastructure projects, having contracted by 5% of market share since 2015. And that's a very important factor which has led, no doubt, to this bill and to Labor's uh, comprehensive uh, steel jobs plan, uh, which we will seek uh, to add to this bill through amendments. Um, and of course, the proposals contained in this bill and in our amendments are actually not novel are not out of left field. Labor governments in South Australia and Victoria have implemented procurement policies which assist the sustainable production of steel in regional areas. The South Australian government is focusing on measures that recognise the economic benefit from, procu from procurement through labour, capital investment and supply inputs via small to medium enterprises in the steel value chain, as well as mandating supply to Australian standards and third party compliance to lift the quality uh, for government projects. And federally they do it on subs. Well, I'll come to that. While the Victorian Government has also developed procurement practices that recognise the economic value through the value chain, they have strengthened this through a focus on strategic projects such as the East-West Link having 90% local content rules for steel and the level crossings work, works requiring 100% local steel content. Uh, the Australian Government has recently announced new duties of up to $4 million, penalising the dumping of steel on the Australian market. The Prime Minister also recently announced that the 600 <coughs> kilometre rail line operated by the Australian Rail Track Authority would be built with steel produced from Arium in Wyala without any tender process taking place. And of course the Australian Prime Minister has also indicated that the submarines, the subject of that hotly contested uh, procurement tender process in South Australia, would be built with Australian steel. No tender, no talk about a mix of Australian and international steel. Just, 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 just waving the wand, the fear. The Australian subs will be built using Australian steel, along with the Australian Rail Track Authority rail line. 
Well, well, the Australian Prime Minister, uh, staring down the barrel of the community's judgment in an election, he knows which side the community is on. He knows that when an industry as big as an important as steel is in crisis, governments not only have to put their shoulders to the wheel uh, uh, through getting the best trade deals, but they actually have to put their money on the table. They have to say that, as a customer, we will prioritise the use of Australian-made steel for, for important Australian infrastructure projects. Now, of course, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, similar approaches mm -hmm. are also being taken by governments overseas. For example, the British government has recently put in place regulations that allow producers to consider environment and social criteria, including employment and supply chain activity, when letting contracts for construction and infrastructure projects. In addition to, to recognising the value to the supply chain, they also include a whole-of-life assessment for in infrastructure projects using steel. That would be a Tory government. Uh, that is, in fact, a Tory government. Not a coalition no. Tory government, but a Tory, Tory government. Cameron, yeah. uh, this means assessing projects and tenders beyond just the upfront construction and implementation costs, but to take account of the whole-of-life costs, including maintenance uh, and repairs. And I, I draw honourable members attention to the uh, Australian Steel Institute submission to the Legislative Assembly Committee on Transport and Infrastructure Inquiry into the procurement of New South Wales Government infrastructure projects. It's, it's definitely worth a read and would certainly uh, educate those op opposite about what is a rational economic response to the crisis in the Australian, Australian steel industry, not merely uh, an ideologically blinkered approach. And, uh, um, <coughs> uh, and, of course, the approach of the British government also means looking at the economic benefits of better engaging with local industry. Interestingly, the Cameron government in the UK has also responded to the steel crisis and domestic pressure to save their steel industry by announcing the part nationalisation of their steel industry. Now, that's not, a process, that's, not a, that's not a course of action we recommend, but that just indicates the flavour of what is happening international, internationally and what governments of all stripes and persuasions are doing to save their domestic steel industries, which of course not only important economically, but they have amazing important strategic value for those countries and our own country. And how can we take a lesser approach than, than David Cameron's Tory government in the UK? The Australian Senate is currently conducting a public inquiry into the Australian steel industry. All major submissions to the inquiry have called for a change to procurement policy by federal, state and territory governments, including the 90% uh, mandating of Australian steel use in all publicly funded infrastructure projects. While Australia does have obligations under free trade agreements, which restrict procurement policies on the basic grounds of competition, uh, as I've indicated, I do not believe this legislation or the policies that it, would that it would embody, including the amendments that we propose, would breach those free trade agreements. For example, Article 15 of the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement does provide for government procurement preferences uh, in certain circumstances. It should also be noted that the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement exempts the US steel industry um, and large sections of government procurement. And, of course, this agreement is due for a 10-year review, uh, I think, starting in May of this year, just gone. And so this now does provide a great opportunity for Australia to seek to exempt our steel sector generally as well. <clears throat> but as I said, I don't believe that the legislation or our amendments would breach the free trade agreements because we're not seeking to put this stamp for all players on all projects in the steel industry everywhere, just those paid for and acquired by the New South Wales State Government and its instrumentalities and local yeah, government. New South Wales taxpayer. Right? By the New South Wales taxpayer, I acknowledge that. Simply saying that we as a customer would take a certain approach, which we are allowed to do. Um, <laughs> <coughs> the claims by the federal government that Australia is well, by, in fact, by the state government that Australia is constrained by may face retaliation um, if Australian governments favour local steel, of course, is highly questionable. As, as the, for example, as the, uh, the Chafter Agreement between Australia and China does not contain an agreement on government procurement, for example. 
And I have already referred to statements by the current Prime Minister regarding the submarines to be built with Australian steel, and of course the Australian Rail Track Authority's approach to building its track. Um, the United States has gone so far as to imposing 260% tariffs or duties on certain product groups and is proceeding to strengthen domestic procurement requirements, particularly at a state level. And a number of states, such as Illinois, have uh, produced what can only be described as old-fashioned protectionist measures to bolster and protect their steel industry in America. We're not proposing those approaches at all. Not at all. We are not, we're taking uh, a much uh, more cautious, sensible and balanced approach, mindful of things like free trade agreements. <coughs> um, of course, it should be noted that the former New South Wales Labor government did introduce a limited preference for small and medium enterprises in its procurement policies in 2010-11, which of course was discontinued by the O'Farrell government, and changes to the New South Wales procurement policy was a key component of Labor's 10-point Illawarra jobs plan launched in 2015. This builds on those earlier uh, announcements, and we will seek to, to go further uh, with the amendments that we will be proposing. There is also a further scope for New, scope for New <coughs> South Wales to review the steel fabrication sector regarding its supply chain capability and improve coordination, innovation, research and development, uh, which we will seek to advance through our amendments. There is substantial criticism that the steel and fabrication sector is highly fragmented, its supply <coughs> chain capability is compromised and investment in plant and equipment is declining. No. Uh, BIS Shrapnel has indicated that a local content policy achieving a 90% local steel content from publicly funded projects would provide a substantial net benefit to the economy and lead to only marginal increases in total construction costs of 0.2 per cent of total, uh, construction co of total uh, procurement costs. A local procurement policy of the kind uh, proposed in the Bill and in Labor's amendments, and I acknowledge that interjection, will greatly strengthen certainty in the sector and provide a platform for investment growth and even expansion not only in steel making but throughout the supply chain, not only for the steel industry but for other industries as well. The benefits to the manufacturing sector will fan out from Port Kembla through the west and southwest of Sydney, through the Hunter region and right across this great state of New South Wales. The reason for this is that fabricators and manufacturers that rely on steel inputs will be on a more level playing field than we see currently, where overseas customers Competitors use sub-cost and substandard steel to undercut competition for New South Wales government, and I dare say local council projects as well. This is a cost-effective policy change that would deliver gains much greater than any nominal increase in any ticketed price for steel. The Australian Steel Institute states that maximising local content is of huge importance, estimating that for every $1 million of local manufacturing output gained or retained in New South Wales, six full-time jobs are retained. $225,300 of tax revenue is generated, and nearly $65,000 worth of welfare benefits are saved. Um, and of course, BIS Shrapnel estimates that the proposed 90% local steel content would cost anywhere between $61 and $80 million annually for Australia, which would translate to an impact for New South Wales of between $19 and $24 million a year, which uh, we think is a, an investment worth making when you look at the devastation of the loss of jobs to local economies and the increase in welfare, to say nothing of the additional pressures placed on families and society through, through marriage and other relationship breakdowns consequent upon economic. I acknowledge that interjection, social breakdown. We want to uh, invest a small amount of money to prevent this devastation from a cost. It's an investment, not a cost. That is absolutely right. Um, and of course, what is important of noting that this is not just uh, a secure and sustainable industry for the Illawarra. While securing the economic future for the Illawarra, this is in fact a steel plan for all of New South Wales. Throughout the whole of life's assessment focus, it will improve the integrity and longevity of every publicly funded infrastructure project in the state and provide better value for money, not just by looking at the upfront costs, but the total costs over the life cycle of a, of a project. The plan will also provide confidence and secure the future for those companies that supply products and services to the steel industry in the Illawarra. And of course, our message is very clear, Labor's message is very clear. We support the steel and manufacturing base in the Illawarra and the thousands of jobs relying on it, and the tens of thousands of jobs that rely upon that industry remaining strong and focused. Again, 
not just for steel, not just for the Illawarra, but for all the supply chains and industries that depend upon it, including biofuels, many other industries, Madam Deputy President. I commit we, we will be supporting the bill on the second read, and I ask honourable members to support our amendments as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah.